The following interview was conducted with Professor Robert A. Ben Kayser, Hufti Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus of Chemistry at Purdue University for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, June 12, 2009, at his residence in West, in West Lafayette. Welcome, Dr. Ben Thank Kager, you. Thank and you. Uh, Thank you. welcome. Tell us a little bit about your parents and sure. siblings in early years. Well, uh, I was born on February the 16th, 1920, in Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, both of my parents, my mother and my dad, were of German descent, both sides. Um, my dad was, uh, in fact, could speak German rather fluently, but he did not want to speak German, and he did not want me to speak German. He said, we are in America now, and you speak English, not German. So uh, I, I took German later on because I was in science, and we had to take German as one of the foreign languages. But uh, my background, <laughs> the German didn't do me a darn bit of good. Well, anyway, um, I was brought up in a, in, a, in a very loving atmosphere, you might say. My parents, I was the only child, and uh, my parents were quite religious. They were both Catholics, a cradle cradle Catholics, you might say, and uh, when I was brought up, I was brought up also Catholic, and uh, I look back in those days, and, you know, the first recollection I have of, of our home is that my grandparents built that home, and it was a three-story structure on what was called McMicken Avenue, 2403 McMicken Avenue. And my grandfather built that, and he built it so that my mother and dad could have the second floor apartment if they wanted it. And uh, so they took that, and that's where I was born. And uh, as I say, as I look back now, you know, I was, it was a very loving, background that my parents really wanted me and it was obvious to me later on they really wanted me and they loved me a lot and um, okay my schooling there was just no question that I was going to go to the local parochial school uh, Catholic school I went to the Sacred Heart Catholic School and uh, at so-called Camp Washington uh, and I'm not sure anymore why Camp Washington must have so, some connection, but I don't know the Washington. Uh, but anyway, I went there, and it was run by the Franciscan nuns who still had their headquarters in Oldenburg, Indiana. And uh, those nuns were really very good. Uh, discipline was very important in that school. And to this day, I believe that one must be disciplined in order to learn. Uh, but, you know, it was not an overpowering sort of discipline, but they, they would, you had to measure up. And uh, they really pounded in reading, writing, and arithmetic. And uh, when I mean arithmetic, I had to learn the multiplication tables and the division tables, and I could even take square roots and cube roots and uh, things which you all do on a calculator now. People won't even know how to do those without a calculator, but uh, I learned all that. And they were very, very insistent on grammar. I, uh, I learned a lot about grammar, oh, subject, verbs, adjectives, adverbs. We had to parse sentences and all that. Now, oh, when we practiced penmanship, there was a and I think we learned the Palmer method, as it was called in those days. And you know, I didn't know how important that was at the time, but uh, I, I really was lucky in my grade school education in that I had 
the really the essentials. Good, um, good foundation. Good foundation. Right. I, I didn't appreciate it that much, but I do now. How about how large was this, the school? Was it eighth grades? Yeah, eighth grade. Okay. One to eight. That's all it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there was a, really a turning point in my education, which at the time I didn't recognize, but it was a very important turning point because it became time for me to go to high school. And uh, the city of Cincinnati at that time, uh, the archbishop there had it set up so that if you went to such and such grade school, then you automatically went to, in my case, it was called Roger Bacon High School. And if you were somewhere else in the area of Cincinnati, then you might go to Purcell High School, and so on. But you know, I'm not sure how this turned around, but my dad, for some reason, thought I ought to go to a Jesuit high school. Uh, there was a uh, Xavier Church in downtown Cincinnati that my dad used to attend quite frequently on his way to work. And uh, the Jesuits, even in those days, were well known for their education. And so he said, no, I think you ought to go to St. X, as it was known, St. Xavier High School. Uh, much to the chagrin of our pastor, who didn't, he thought I should have gone to Roger Bacon, but I went to Xavier, and that was a turning point in, in my life. I didn't realize how important that was. Uh, the Jesuits at that time, uh, they were excellent teachers, really excellent teachers. In their preparation for the priesthood, they had to teach about 10 years or so. It took them a long time from the time they entered the Jesuit order to the time they were ordained a priest. And part of that time was spent in teaching, either at the high school or the college level, what have you. And so again, I had some excellent high school teachers there, just uh, outstanding. And, you know, they took a personal interest in you. Boy, I had an algebra teacher. I can see him now, boy. Go to the board. And so you went to the board, and he'd give you a an algebra problem that you got to work in front of the class. And English, I had one of the best English teachers, and boy, that poor fellow, he happened not to be a Jesuit. He was one of the lay teachers there. They had a couple of lay teachers, but we had to write. I mean, he said, now, I, uh, one week from today, I want you to write a short story, and it should be on such and such. Or you do this, and you do that. But you wrote and you wrote and you wrote and that poor fellow would correct those things by hand and give them back and there'd be red marks and slashes and you know there's just no way in my mind to know how to write other than to write <laughs> at least that's my present opinion and we wrote plenty there and uh, so I went through high school for four years, and I got a great, I really, my parents were very <clears throat> proud of me. It turns out that neither of my parents had much of an education. Uh, my dad was brought up in a very poor family. He had eight grades of education, and then he had to go to work because the family was so poor. And my mother, she had about eight grades of education, and I don't think she may have even gone to high school. I'm not too sure. But my dad, though, he had to go to work. And uh, he really had a lot of abilities, but because he had to go to work, he, he really they didn't come out of him. And, he wanted me to get an education. He wanted me very much. And, you know, I wanted to please him. And uh, so I worked hard in high school. 
<laughs> with those Jesuits. Uh, I really put in a lot of time. Sometimes I thought, uh, well, I was a B-plus student that became an A student because I worked hard. So I don't know. But anyway, I, I did well in high school. And uh, I did well in part because I know it pleased my parents so much when I got good grades and so on. Uh, there was an added benefit then. After four years in that high school, uh, I graduated the top of the class. And I was awarded a four years free tuition scholarship to Xavier University in Cincinnati. The Jesuits ran the high school and they ran the university. Well, my parents were delighted because they're still very poor and to go to the university cost even more money in those days and I don't know whether I would have even made it, but I, I won this tuition-free scholarship. And so I, I went to uh, Xavier University, which was also in Cincinnati. Uh, and still is. And still is. And it's, of course, it's blossomed. <laughs> oh, they got great basketball team. They oh, didn't yeah. have anything much like sure. that oh, yeah. when I was there. It's blossomed, as you said. Yeah, right. yeah. But anyway... Uh, I gather that you uh, didn't board, but you lived at home and went to school? Uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, no. There was... Some of them did board there, but, okay. you know, gee, I, I just had to take a bus from my house and uh, Really, it was not far at all. Uh, that was another thing. You know, in my day, in the early 1920s, uh, automobiles were rarities. I think Henry Ford invented the Model T in something like 1928 or 29, sure. something like that. Right. <laughs> and uh, the first automobile we had was a Model A Ford. My dad bought it used about 19... 31 or thereabout. So, uh, no, you most of the time you walk where you want to go. And that wasn't bad either, to tell you the truth. You walk and you walk and you walk. So, nowadays, if we didn't know those days the medical advantages of getting walking in, but we had to walk. And so we walked. Anyway, uh, any, uh, what, in college, were you any student activities at all? or uh, a, a little, but you know, okay. I you had a did not busy go schedule. in for that a lot because it, I thought it inter interfered with my studies. And, um, you know, in those days, when I went up there to Xavier <laughs> University, you know, what was I going to major in? Well, really, in those days... It was either you become an MD or a lawyer or you went into business or law, something like that. And it just weren't all these possibilities that you've got now. Right. And so I, when I entered uh, Xavier U, I, I went in as a pre-med student. I don't know, pre-med sounded good to me. So I was going to, you know, I saw I took biology and while the biology teacher knew what he was talking about, he was not all that inspiring. And it was kind of like rote memory, a lot of it. And uh, yeah, it was all right, but my chemistry teacher was really a charmer. Boy, he taught chemistry. And he really had got me excited in chemistry. I mean, I... Boy, to this day, I think about that priest. Uh, he was a Jesuit priest, and uh, he also became my counselor. So that after about one year there, he counseled me the first two years. And uh, by that time, he said, now, Bob, you're going to have to make up your mind whether you want to go into medicine or chemistry, because now the curriculum begin to diverge. Well, I picked chemistry because of the teacher I had. It was just a, he made it so interesting. And as I say, my biology teacher was competent, but that wasn't enough. Sure, I understand. <laughs>
So I became chemistry, you know. And another thing which was uh, of interest there, there was the ROTC program at Xavier University. And it was an army program, field artillery. And uh, because Xavier was so small in those days, uh, the army required or that they have a certain number of students enter the ROTC or they weren't going to bother sending officers there to train them and so on. So for the first two years, the ROTC was compulsory. At Xavier. You had to As it was at other schools at that time. It could have been. Sure. Anyway, I went into the ROTC and like everything else, I threw my best into that too, you know. And uh, as time went on, <clears throat> war clouds became more imminent. See, I, I went into Xavier U in 19, from 34 to 38, I was at Xavier High School. From 38 to 42, I was at the university and I graduated in 1942. And of course there was December or, the, or whatever it was, December the 11th, 8th or 11th or whatever, 1941, right. a day that will live in infamy. And uh, I remember that day very well. Uh, it was, a, well anyway, I was in the ROTC and uh, there was just no doubt by that time uh, that, uh, well, my counselor, he said, you know, Bob, he said, you might be able, since you're in chemistry, you might be exempt from the Army, but there's no assurance for that. You know, I, I think you ought to just stay in the ROTC and just graduate as a second lieutenant in the field artillery. So I, I, uh, I went, uh, but I didn't go in, uh, initially, the, the, most of the class who were going to go into the ROTC went over to uh, Fort Thomas, Kentucky for their physical. And boy, at that time, this was before the war, they were so careful. If you had a fast heartbeat, they rejected you. So, well, I didn't go then. I was still, oh, should I go, should I not go? And that was, uh, that, that was about June of whatever, 41, I guess. And uh, no, I guess that was June of 40. And anyway, I didn't know what I should do. But as time went on, uh, I, I went over, all by myself, I went over there and they, there were a bunch of recruits over there undergoing a physical, and I just, they put me in with the recruits, and I was past the physical, so I was going ahead for my, uh, boy, they weren't as careful on those recruits as they were when they were going over the people for the, for the officer's training <laughs> corps. Uh, I didn't know that at the time, but okay. So, um, all right came time for graduation and by that time we were in the war and uh, incidentally I I did pretty well in the ROTC. I uh, advanced to the lieutenant colonel who was the head of the shebang there as a student lieutenant colonel and I still remember those officers that taught me there. I learned a lot there too. We had one semester course from them on the gasoline engine. And that fellow knew his stuff. And I was intrigued by the gasoline engine. I really enjoyed that. And to this day, I enjoy mechanical things like the gasoline engine on my riding mower. And I love the tinker with that thing until it just is right because I, I remember all that stuff from from there from, from there. there sure and uh, anyway uh, okay uh, came time for graduation and I was I got my uh, orders I, I was a second lieutenant in the field artillery when I graduated from Xavier 
Uh, I had a Bachelor of Science degree in, with a major in chemistry, but I was also a sec commissioned as a second lieutenant in the field artillery. And I'm sure, you know, which direction I was going to go in those days, because we were at war. And uh, I, I was called over, though. Uh, I didn't go over with the rest of them. I don't recall exactly. Oh, yeah, I, I got my orders. I had to come over to Fort Thomas and undergo another physical before I got into the regular Army, even though I was now commissioned as a, in the Reserve Officers Training Corps. So I went over to Fort Thomas and uh, stayed there about two weeks and I took a physical exam and I still had to wait around and the captain, uh, I was attached to the unit there, I kept saying every day, you know, are my results in yet? Why, why aren't, what's the matter? What, what's, he's, I don't know, I, we haven't gotten your results yet. Yeah, you know, I didn't know and I can remember very distinctly going in there during that physical and they had a sergeant in there right behind the desk and he said did you take a physical here before I said yeah I did I said, two years ago when I was uh, got, got into the uh, advanced training of the ROTC and he said well he said we got to take a chest x-ray but he said if uh, if we got it here in the files, we'll just skip it. And I can remember him going over to the file drawer. He goes through there. You know, I don't see it. You got to take another. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was the army. Anyway, they took a, another X-ray of my chest, and I but I waited, waited, and waited. And then finally, one day, the captain came to me and he said, "Oh, he said they want to talk to you over at the hospital." go up to the hospital and they said uh, you're rejected as an officer uh, you've got uh, some slight calcium deposit on your lung and uh, it's too big uh, for an officer and so you will get an honorable discharge uh, from the army but you got to go to your draft board to register because it may be okay. You might get in as a buck private. So I had to register at my draft board. <laughs> and you know, I heard okay. later on that the draft board absolutely was baffled what to do with my case. Here I had all the training and an honorary discharge, <laughs> you know, and now I'm up there as a buck private. And, and, Ultimately, they gave me a 4F, which was the medical, they didn't sure. take me, you know, but, oh boy, I was worried about that thing on my lung, I'm only smoking, oh, what is this? Family doctor, he said, oh, Bob, I, I don't think it's anything. He said, but now there's a lung specialist here in Cincinnati, and I'm going to send you to him, and he will, what he tells you, you can believe. And I remember very vividly going to that lung specialist <clears throat> and he uh, he took his own x-rays and he said to me you know he said I'll bet you half of the people in Cincinnati got what you got he said that's a little bit of he said it's so sooty and dirty down here he said people are breathing in all this stuff and he said you had a little bit of that and and it just calcified over he said, don't worry about it. He says, if you want, he said, I'll write you an approval and you can get into the army. <laughs> and I said, well, don't, don't bother about that. I mean, by that time I was, I'd had it, you know. I agree. So I went back up to my counselor at the university and I said, believe it or not, I'm not in the army. And I said, I should have gone ahead in chemistry. Well. He said, let me get on the phone. And he called up a friend of another Jesuit priest at the University of Detroit, in Detroit, Michigan. And I don't know what he told him, but he said, uh, well, you, he, he will be in contact with you. Well, I went home, and about 
few days later, the phone rang. Here's a priest by the name of Father Scheibel, S.J., said to me, uh, would you like to come up here uh, and get into our master's program in chemistry? Boy, uh, yeah, it sounds good to me. And you know, all this was really very important because it was a two-year program. A lot of schools only a one-year program, but theirs was two because you had to be a teaching assistant. And as part of the graduate as studies. part of the graduate studies. And so I taught, and that is where I discovered what I really wanted to do. That teaching just fascinated me. You know, chemistry fascinated me. <laughs> and being able to know something and to take somebody who doesn't know anything and teach them so they know it. To me, that was a challenge. I really, really enjoyed that. And that's where I really got the idea that I wanted to teach and teach chemistry and what I wanted to do. Well, I got my master's degree at the University of Detroit. Excuse and me, again, was, that, was that all male at the University of Detroit? Uh, no, oh. it was not. Okay. There were women also going to school. Uh, the Xavier was. Xavier was, yes. Xavier was, but not U of D. Okay. <laughs> In fact, a couple of my colleagues, they're married, some of them, they're not there, but later on married some of their former students up there, but I didn't. Uh -huh. I was, had my nose to the grindstone, so to speak. And, but the fellow up there at U of D, he had graduated from Iowa State University. Oh, at that time it was, less, it was uh, Iowa State, it wasn't called the university, at Ames, Iowa. And he said to me, uh, you know, Bob, um, you're an organic chemist. Uh, there's somebody out there that's really a very distinguished organic chemist by the name of Henry Gilman. I uh, said, he he's a tough guy, very tough. But uh, he said, I could get you in there because he said, I think Henry would remember me, even though I was a physical chemist. Okay, and, and then, oh, I heard more rumors about Henry Gillen, and most of them were true. Um, anyway, I was told <laughs> this prof at the University of Detroit that I heard, he said he tends to keep his students a long time before they get their PhDs. He said, but I, I was told that if you can get a commitment from him, before you go, as to how long it'll take you, uh, he'll stick to it. So, I get on the phone to Henry Gilman, and uh, I said, how long would it take, you know? He said, uh, two and a half years after your master's. That didn't sound too bad to me. So, I went to Iowa State, and uh, that was the land-grant school of the University of Iowa. At the state. Of Iowa, right. just like Purdue was, although at the time with the name Purdue you didn't know, you know I didn't know that until I almost got here. But and anyway, still, excuse me, it's still a lot of people no, because it doesn't exactly because it's got the name Purdue. And the only other one that's similar, of course, is Cornell because Cornell is quasi, you know, state and private. Right, right. Yeah. Well, anyway, I went out to Ames, Iowa, to work with Henry Gilman and. That was a revelation. First of all, Henry Gilman worked in a specialized area of organic chemistry called organometallics. It was organic molecules that are bonded to metals. Now, he was the leading organometallic chemistry in this country, if not in the world, really. He was an authority on organometallics. And so, when I went out there, I worked for Henry Gilman. Now, it was still the war years. And so I go out there, and Henry Gilman, as he was prone to do, didn't put me on organometallic chemistry right away. He said, um, I want you to work on my anti-malarial program. He said, uh, 
I've got a grant for, for work, government work on malaria. And incidentally, at that time, our troops out in the Pacific, as I read one time later, more troops were being downed and killed by malaria than by, by the Japanese bullets. I heard that. That was you know? a, a relative. My aunt's husband uh, served in the war, and he still had ref, you know things even over the years. See, afterwards. they were in the islands over there, and mosquitoes, and oh, it was yeah. just... So I was in his anti-malarial degree uh, program. So I worked on anti-malarials. And he was a slave driver. That guy, Gilman, gosh, he'd come around morning, noon, or night into your lab. And if you weren't there, why weren't you there? And you'd hear from him. And people were scared to death of him. And the son of a gun, you know, he would decide when you got your degree he would suddenly say, write your thesis, you can go now, you know. But, believe it or not, well, I think the record was 10 years. Somebody out there was out there 10 years working for Gilman. And Gilman was grinding out his publications. At the same time, he was upping Gilman's name. There's a long story about this, which I don't want to go into here, but it's the first time I came into very close contact with African Americans. Gilman had a fair number of black students working for him. And uh, of course, I was working for him, and you got to know these people. Sure. And uh, to this day, I, I remember some of them very, very well. Uh, one of them, his name was Sam Massey. He said to me one day, he said, Bob, he, you don't know. He said, when I first came out here, I couldn't even work up in these labs. He said, they put me in a basement lab because I was isolated because I was black. And uh, they could not find housing out in Ames, Iowa. Uh, <laughs> Sam told me a funny story. He said, I couldn't find any place to live. Nobody wanted to take in blacks. And he said, uh, I tried to get into the YMCA. And he said, I quote, he said, head of the YMCA said, Sam, it wouldn't be the Christian thing to do to take you in. And what he meant was they would make life so miserable for him, but it wasn't the Christian thing to do, unquote. Mm -hmm. Now I must say, in retrospect, I think Gilman really exploited those blacks. They couldn't get jobs. Even though they'd get PhDs, they couldn't get jobs. Even when I came here to Purdue and I got some black students, I couldn't get them jobs. It drove me crazy. On one occasion, I was consulting for the General Electric Corporation in Schenectady, New York, and I go out there and I've got this good black student, he just wanted a master's degree, and I said, I said, Bob, this guy is really good. I said, you could get him easily. Why don't you? He said, Bob, if I hired him, he said, he wouldn't go anywhere in the General Electric Company. He said, he's black. He just won't do it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And finally, that same black student said to me, Doc, don't take it so hard. He said, I I know what you're going through. I, it's, I'm accustomed to this sort of thing. <laughs> he was consoling me. He <laughs> you understood. Know? Uh, you know, and for any, but he appreciated, knew what you were doing. Right. Yeah. Oh, afterwards, you know, it's quite a few of them said, "Thank you, thank you, you know, for your efforts and so on." Sure. Uh, now, I found out why my friend Gilman got all those black students out there. I'm not, it was not altruism in my mind. He got his degree from Harvard from a German chemist named Kohler. That Gilman got a degree at Harvard from Kohler. And Kohler had a student there by the name of Percy Julian. That became a famous name, really. And 
Kohler later on said, this guy was a genius. He was, well, he was black. He was a genius. He said, one of the best I have ever seen. He couldn't get him a job either, it turned out, even though he was from Harvard. But somehow or other, Percy Julian, a businessman in Chicago, hired Percy Julian. This was on uh, um, the PBS program about a year or two ago. It was on Percy Julian. The guy in Chicago took him on. He was an industrial took him on in his industry, and he was pushing soybeans at the time, this industrial guy in Chicago. He said to Percy Julian, let's see what you can do chemically with soybeans. And this guy took soybeans, and he made plastics out of soybeans. He did everything with soybeans. <laughs> that was Percy Julian. And it went through my mind to this day, my friend Gilman was out there at the time, getting his PhD with Kohler, and he bumped into Percy Julian, who was a genius. And so when he came back out to Ames, he went down to these southern black schools and would bring these fellows up from these southern schools. I mean, Fisk. Oh, I don't even know what the names of them are anymore, but that, this Sam Massey was from Fisk, I remember that. But, you know, he kept them forever and ever and ever. And, yeah. uh, gee, I look back, those poor guys, not only were they imposed upon out there, but even then they couldn't get jobs. Mm -hmm. One good. of them, one of them, his dad was a Pullman porter. And he... I don't know what happened. He became an alcoholic. You know, I tell you, my introduction to the blacks came out there, and, and the funny thing was, Cincinnati had so many blacks there when I was there, but it didn't dawn on me. I mean, this black-white issue in my day, it didn't dawn on me. What a terrible thing, how we were mistreating these people. You know, boy, they were still slaves in many respects. Well, anyway, that's new here. So anyway, uh, one day Gilman said to me, what do you want to do? Have you decided what you want to do? And I said, yeah, I want to teach. I could, he, I could see he liked that because he was a teacher himself, you know, although he did more research than teaching. But anyway, uh, one day he came into the lab, and this was in... Oh, about July of 46. Now, I went out there in 44, and he said two and a half years. So you add that up, and that would have been, I had about another half year to go out there, I think. But he came into my lab one day, and he said, Bob, I was on the phone with Henry Haas at Purdue. He's the head of the chemistry department at Purdue. And he said, he's looking to hire somebody. And he said, I suggested you. And then he, he said, I said, really? He said, yeah. And I said, you, you don't have your degree yet. And uh, he said, I said two and a half years. So he said, you'll have to come back next summer. He was going to get his last drop of blood out. I have, so he's anyway. going to hold you to that two and a half. Exactly. So anyway, uh, I can remember before I came to Purdue to interview, his name was Henry B. Haas, Henry Bone, B-O-H-N, Haas, and I think there's a distinct, there's a name professorship over there. It, it could be Graham Cooks, I'm not sure. One of those over there has That's Henry B. Haas, distinguished professor behind his name. He was head of the department here, and I can remember Gilman saying, well, uh, I said to him, well, how do I uh, prepare for, for this interview? interview? I, I'd never interviewed before. You know. And, you know, I'm not too clear what he did tell me, but he said, listen, Bob, he said, I made you out to be practically a god when I talked to Henry Haas, and you better go there and perform well. You know, <laughs> God, <laughs> that was so, you know, it was the summer. 
I came through here in the hot July month of 1946. And, you know, Henry B. Haas interviewed me just for an hour or two. He had his mind made up. He wanted to get a Henry Gilman man on his faculty here. That's what it turned out. Because Gilman had a tremendous reputation in this organometallic field. And uh, anyway, you know, they, nothing was, was nearly as... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he didn't call the faculty at all. He was the head, and he said, yeah, you know, know okay, he said, yeah, you'll hear from me shortly. So I remember going on to Cincinnati to visit my folks on this trip, and uh, he called me up on the phone, and he said, uh, I'm going to offer you a 10-month appointment at $4,200. This was Henry Haas talking. And he said, now, uh, you don't have your Ph.D. yet. So he said, uh, you're only going to get the rank of an instructor. Well, gee, I didn't, you know. So to make a long story short, I joined, all right, I officially joined the faculty at Purdue on September 1, 1946, as an instructor in organic chemistry without my PhD degree. And I remember Ha saying to me, now be sure you go back next summer and get that degree, because he said, I don't want anybody on my faculty without their PhD degree. Oh, okay, Henry. So, also, I said, well, he didn't, I wasn't introduced to any of the faculty. I didn't know any of the faculty. I'd only met Haas, that's all. Was the building what's known as Weatherall today? Was that the building? Uh, that's, yes. So that was built at that but, time. I'm not sure. It wasn't called the Weatherall Building. Well, probably not, but, not, that, you know, that but that's location. the one it was. Yeah, that was the only chemistry building at that time. Right. That might have even been the name at that time. Uh, and Haas had a pretty good reputation himself as a chemist. I mean, he learned how to so create so-called nitrate hydrocarbons. He was responsible for an, a, a small industry to open up here in Indiana, down in Terre Haute, as I recall. Anyway, uh, I can remember going into Haas and said, well, here I am, what do I do? And he said, go out to the armory, they're registering students there. In those days, they registered them in the armory. And he said, look up Frank Martin. He's, he's a teacher, he's the head of general chemistry. Okay. <laughs> Go out to the armory and oh boy, what bedlam in that armory! Here were all I've seen these pictures of where students going around, and I had a hard time getting through. And each department, my chemistry, had a desk there, but it was kind of dangerous, almost the way they were shoving and pushing. Anyway, uh, I got up there, and here's Frank Martin. Somebody said that's Frank Martin. So I go over to Frank. I introduced myself. Frank hardly paid attention. I said, Frank, what do you want me to do? He said, hold this crowd back. <laughs> that was my first first job, hold this crowd back. So uh, I helped him out there, and I taught general chemistry under Frank D. Martin, Frank Dayton Martin, lived on Vine Street, never had any kids, and he was a rather eccentric kind of guy himself. But uh, I enjoy oh, teaching freshman chemistry. You know, I, you know what one of my first jobs was? I taught chemistry to the home economics girls. That was an all-girl thing, home economics. We had that out at Iowa State, too. I wasn't, I wasn't in there, but all the women would take home economics. But they had to take, everybody at that time at Purdue had to take one year of chemistry. And so Frank puts me, nobody else really wanted to teach the girls, because they really weren't that good in chemistry, or they didn't care that much about it was chemistry. A requirement. But, but to me, I didn't care. I liked to teach, and I taught them, and I, I, I think, they liked me pretty well. <laughs> the home economics girl. I know the dean of home ec 
Can't even think of her name anymore. She was that have been Eva Goble? No, oh, preceded yeah. her. Math, math. Mary Math. Mary, Mary Math. The hall is named after her. Right. That's the one. Right. Uh, she thought the world knew all of me because these girls were drifting back, saying, "Oh, that chemistry isn't bad, you know." And so on. So, well, but Frank Martin, he always taught the engineers because Frank was a Frank graduated as a chemical engineer himself. And he always favored the engineering school here. Uh, this was an engineering school, as far as Frank Martin was concerned, and he didn't care about home ec or those things. But anyway, I did, as I say, and it was because I just loved to teach. Okay, but the next, uh, that was, I taught, oh, yeah. The other thing I remember, see, I joined September 1, 1946. July 1, 1946, um, uh, Fred Hovde was the was the appointed president. So Hovde was appointed president July one. I was appointed in September one. And I remember very vividly Fred Hovde calling us together for a faculty meeting. And a, a university faculty? Yeah, yeah, you, oh, yeah, and things were done very informally. I don't even remember how the word was sent out, but I, I was there because I knew we were supposed to be there. And, and I can remember Fred Hubby was a very stern individual, and he said, well, now, gentlemen, uh, the cost of living is going up, and um, you're going to get, uh, and he named a percent raise. I would have to figure it out. Anyway, I started out at 4,200. I mean, I was here only a couple of months and I was getting 4,500, just like that. So I got a quick raise, <laughs> a cost of living raise. And I remember Fred Hubby saying, but don't get accustomed to this. When the cost of living drops down, your pay will drop down too. It never did. It never did. But he said it, I swear he said it. <laughs> anyway, okay, I went through and I felt awfully embarrassed. The first faculty meeting in chemistry I attended, but nobody um, nobody knew me because Henry Haas had not introduced me at all. Were you the only new one or was there some others that were new at that time? I'm sorry? Were you the only new one or were there, was there anybody else, do you recall? Uh, Henry, uh, Bill Truce came. Bill, who he passed away, he was 92. He passed away in January of this year, oh. Bill Truce. He came same time I did, really. Basically, we, but he had his PhD from Northwestern. Uh, and I got to know Bill as a result of that. But um, anywho, uh, I got diverted. But uh, okay, well, I went to that first faculty meeting and nobody knew me. They'd look and say, who, you know, who is that guy? Henry Haas didn't even introduce me. And then the word got out that I was Catholic. And Henry Haas said to me one day, he called me and he said, you're not Catholic, are you? I said, yeah, I am. Well, he didn't say anything more, but I wondered in the back of my mind whether I would have ever been hired. <laughs> anyway, uh, oh, and then afterwards, a fellow by the name of Herschel Hunt. Well, he was a gruff farmer, but on the staff over there. He called me one day. He said, Bob, it isn't true, is it? You're not Catholic. Yeah, Herschel, I am. You know, it tells you a lot about the state of Indiana and, you know, good, good old my black friend Sam Massey from Iowa State. He told me, Bob, you know, Indiana's got a bad reputation amongst blacks. He said, one day I was driving through Indiana and he said, we had my baby girl in the car and she needed milk. And he said, I stopped at a grocery store and they wouldn't sell me anything because I was black. <laughs> well, don't forget, this was home of the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. Yeah, that's true. 
know, so that's to tell you a little bit about Indiana. I worry today about Obama. Not, I mean, I think he's great. Look, but you saw what happened at that Holocaust Museum in Washington D.C. You know, there are these white supremacists who are raising their heads, and Obama. That worries me a lot as to what's going on there because this racial prejudice still exists in some quarters. Yeah. Anyway. Sorry. Well, what any, was housing like? Uh, no, you were not married at that time? I was not, no, I got married. Uh, I came in September and we got married on, well, in you'd already October. Mentioned you were, were I had to go back to Cincinnati. My wife, my wife was from... Oh, I met my wife at Iowa State. Oh, okay. She was, boy, she was rich out there. She had a, boy, she's got a story to tell you. She majored in mathematics. And she got a master's degree in mathematics. But she said her professor back at Holyoke said to her, don't go into mathematics. There's no room for women in mathematics. Don't, don't do it. You know. But she did it anyway. And she was connected with a war project out at Iowa State. Uh, and that's where she learned statistics out there. That Iowa State was one of the first places that developed the statistics as a field. And now it's so important. I mean, boy, if you, you can't do medical research without statistics. Yeah, and you know what she did out there? It was a deep secret at the time. They, they had two of the real leaders in early statistics out at Iowa State. And uh, she was working on a project, a secret project of did the Allied bombings of Germany, they were picking out targets where they were making ball bearings. And did that have any effect, particular effect, by picking out the ball bearing attacks on the production of the German war machine? And how about the tank production of the, the airplanes and so on? So that's what she was doing at the time. And I might add, when I was out there in Ames, and it was a deep, dark secret in the chemistry department, and Gilman was involved in this too, but I never had a better kept secret was the bomb project. Mm -hmm. They also were involved, involved and in had a very important, played a very important role in the purification of uranium, which they did out there, and which was very important in the development of the bomb. That bomb project was so secret out there. You, we had to, as I said, Gilman made us work night and day so we'd have to come in after dinner at night, but for the guard with a gun sitting at the door of the chemistry building, you had to sign your name and what time you entered. And there was a certain door, you couldn't go through that door, but that's where that secret project was. I had to go upstairs to where Gilman was. His wasn't that secret. But that's where the bomb project was done. In the same building. In the same building. Yeah. And when we dropped the first atomic bomb, the reporters just descended on the chemistry department out there. I mean, there were reporters all over the place talking to Frank Spedding. He headed up the project out there on the purification of uranium. And that's when I then knew what the project was. It was so secretive. They, they did a great job. It was amazing. How many people were involved in that? But it was a well-kept secret. Yeah. Yeah. Oh well. Anyway, I came here to Purdue, and I had my PhD finally. And uh, I right away, as soon as I got through, I was made an assistant professor. I got through, even though I had to come in as an instructor. Haas had promised me, if you get your PhD, you become an assistant professor. Yeah. That's how I did. Well, tell us about the first time you said you were married. You had you had children when you came. Uh, no, oh, no, just, no, no. Where did you live then when you first came? This was after the yeah, war. Yeah, that was, was something. Um, I got a letter uh, out at Ames uh, that when I was out there that summer, 
to finish up. Yeah, I got a letter saying I was going to be in building 21, apartment 11, Ross A. Drive. I go, hey, that's great, you know. So when I came, we weren't married yet. I came in September 1, we didn't get married till October. My wife went back east, but I came here and I went to look where our apartment was gonna be. There was nothing there but a hole in the ground. None of those. Are you talking about married student housing, what's known as that? Is that where it was? Well, or, no, or, it, oh. it's still Roth Aid. You know where Roth Aid Stadium is. Right, okay, all right. The I Building see. 21, Apartment 11 is still up there. Okay. That was it. But it was nothing but a hole in the ground. They had about two buildings built at that time. <laughs> you know, they were way behind on <laughs> all of that stuff. Well, anyway. Then uh, after the war, there were a lot of people for that served in the war that came to the campus. Oh, and exploded. Those were some of the best students we ever had. Those GI people. They, they came, came back. GI Bill. And they had been away from, you know, boy, they were out there in the trenches. And that's another thing. There was no housing. They slept in the field house. They had bunks side by side in the field house. No complaints. They had a roof over their head. That's more than they had, you know, right. over there, so to speak. Right, yeah. right. And they were the best students ever. They were out of school so long. It didn't matter. They worked like dogs. And they wanted to play catch-up because they wanted to get on with their life. They sure did. They and they did. Gap. That, that was one of the greatest things ever, that GI Bill. Yeah. It paid off. I mean, uh, really... These guys, whether they'd have ever gone to college, to tell you the truth, I don't know, but they had this money to go, so they went. Right. Right. And uh, that, you know, they talk about FDR. Uh, I, I remember him very well. Uh, boy, uh, he did a lot of things which were declared unconstitutional later on, but he did things. And, uh, you know, my dad lost his job in the Depression back there. Boy, that was something... Uh, I, I remember so you can say I was born into a depression and then since I'm 89 now I'm probably going to go out in a depression too <laughs> <laughs> let me interrupt for a minute we've got I like to try to keep this to about an hour no no that's okay so what I was going to su suggest